The Word of God, the Holy Bible, is a treasure and a gift beyond compare. Every passage of it points to a marvelous truth that God's love for man impelled him to step out of eternity and unite with his creation in order to redeem him from sin. Jesus Christ is both the author and subject of this precious word. Join us at the Superior Word each week as we search out this wonderful gift in search of Christ Jesus. I said it on the Thursday Bible class, and um, I want to say it again now on the sermon, which is recorded, so that whoever sent this, I want to thank them. Her name is Janice, and I, I'm not going to read you what she said, but she came to Sarasota. She's a nurse, and she came to help uh, with somebody in Sarasota, and she wanted to attend here, and she had to leave because the situation changed with the health or whatever, and she sent the most gracious note I think I've ever gotten in my life through the, the window of the door here. And so I wanted to thank Janice, and I hope she watches not just the Prophecy Updates, but the sermons, because if she watches the sermons, she'll see this. So thank you, Janice. It was very wonderful. Um, second thing is, I had this made. I, I, you can make them yourself on the, uh, on the um, Internet, and then they just ship it to you, and it worked out okay. Hedeko loved it. It's a superior word bumper sticker. It says... Our church, my church, Sarasota, Florida, and online around the world, and that's got superiorword.org on it. Okay, um, so I wanted the people, the reason why I'm doing this now in front of the sermon is because the sermon people and the Bible study people care about this church. The Prophecy Update people, for the most part, care about Prophecy Updates, and that's all they care about. If you get 5,000 views on a Prophecy Update, one or two percent, or is it ten percent? Whatever, ten percent of them will actually be a part of this church. So I'm not going to announce this for the people that watch the Prophecy Update, because it, it, it just isn't for them. Now, if they watch the Prophecy Update and the sermons, that's who I'm talking to. I'm talking about the people that like this church. If this is something that interests you, please let me know, and I will order them. I'm not going to order them unless, uh, uh, because it, the more you order, the cheaper they get. So if this is something that interests the people that watch the sermons and the Bible studies, and you want one, the only thing I would ask, because I'll pay for this, and it's going to be expensive to ship out however many of them, but... Um, the only thing that I would ask is that you would put it on your car. If you don't own a car, then I would ask you to put it on your forehead. But I would, I would expect you to actually put it somewhere where it would be visible to show that you are a member of this church. So that's my second thing. I need to say that again on Thursday at the Bible study, and then Hidako can put it on her car. So would and that be the mark of the... Uh... The mark of the church, yes. And then I have one more thing to read to our online audience before we read our psalm. Here's what it says. Charlie, would you be so kind as to read this at church? It is a letter of gratitude to the wonderful people of the Superior Word. Dear Superior Word Church, online and offline, we cannot thank you enough for all the warm, welcoming, wonderful fellowship and overwhelming generosity you have showed us. You have received us with so much love and kindness, and we pray that the Lord may bless you immensely. We cannot help but look back on how the Lord orchestrated our journey and put Charlie in our lives. I didn't know it said that. I didn't read this. So <laughs> back in 2011 to get us excited about the word. And from there, flourish a beautiful friendship with him and Hedeko, their family, and subsequently each and every one of you. Praise the Lord because we know that his hand has been at work in all of this. We truly worship an amazing God. Needless to say, we have enjoyed our time with you so much. We were so honored and blessed to meet new friends whom faces were familiar from watching online and to get to know better the friends we already knew. Your faith refreshes our joy and your prayers encourage us deeply. After a long journey, we have returned safely to Israel and continue to pray that the Lord will bring us back to the U.S. to be closer to you. May his will be done. May our wonderful Lord bless you. We love you all. Sergio and Rhoda. Aww. And P.S. God willing, we plan to start filming season two soon. So there you go for the uh, Sergio and Rhoda videos. But that, that is from them. They thank you. They had a great time. And I thank you for how you blessed them. Um, yes, it, he will. He's working on it. everything is being done. So it's all in the Lord's hand at this point. Okay, um, we're going to read to start us with our sermon first, the 43rd Psalm. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O oh, deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man, for you are the God of my strength. Why do you cast me off? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? O oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. 
let them bring me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my exceeding joy. And on the harp, I will praise you. O God, my God, why are you cast down? O my soul. And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. <sighs> I feel refreshed just reading that. My hair's standing up all over my body. All right. Um, Esther 2, verses 12 through 23 is where we're at today. So Esther 2, starting in verse 12. Each young woman's turn came to go into King Ahasuerus after she completed 12 months preparation according to the regulations for the women, for thus were the days of their preparation appointed, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. Thus prepared, each young woman went to the king and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the woman's quarters to the king's palace." In the evening she went, and in the morning she returned to the second house of the women, to the custody of Shaashgaz, the king's eunuch, who kept the concubines. She would not go in to the king again, unless the king delighted in her and called for her by name. Now when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter to go in to the king, she requested nothing but what Hegai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women, advised, and Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebet, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made a great feast, the feast of Esther for all his officials and servants, and he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of a king. When virgins were gathered together a second time, Mordecai sat within the king's gate. Now Esther had not revealed her family and her people, just as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Bigdan and Teresh, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. And when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed and both were hanged on a gallows. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Before I actually get into my thoughts on the, uh, from the sermon today, it's funny that I had typed this on a Monday, as I always do, and I met Vic here one day, and we talked, it was just a couple days later, and he brought up exactly the thing that I had talked about, and I have not thought of this stupid thing in 30 or 35 years. It's called Abraham's, or yeah, Abraham Maslow's Pyramid. Now, he uses it in a uh, non-religious reference, and so I'm not diminishing him using that, okay? I want to make sure that people know that. If you want to use it for one thing, that's fine, but for religious purposes and for the idea that Abraham Maslow talked about it is wholly unsuited and you'll hear that in about two seconds when I get into my notes but I just think that it's curious that I haven't thought of Abraham Maslow's pyramid in literally since I was in probably fifth grade and Vic and I were talking about it a couple days later the question is where does satisfaction come from and can we at any time say that we are completely satisfied Abraham Maslow's pyramid was taught to us when I was in school he developed it to show that basic needs had to be met before a person could attain a higher level of satisfaction. As I was taught it, each step up would bring us closer to a marvelous high point where we were truly be satisfied. His level started with physiological needs, food, water, warmth, and rest. If you were deprived of one of these things, you couldn't get beyond that point. It kept you down and you would stay down. After that were safety needs, security, and safety from harm. From there, you progress to love and belonging needs, intimate fellowships and friendships and relationships and things like that. After meeting those needs, up the pointy hill, you climbed to esteem needs. You would meet your desire for prestige and feelings of accomplishment and self-worth. Woohoo! And finally, yes, after a long trek of meeting all of these other needs, you could finally self-actualize. 
There you could find your true full potential, including any creative activities that would allow you to express yourself in a complete way. Unfortunately, you could drop from one point back to a lower point. If you went bankrupt, you might wind up going from self-actualization all the way to physiological needs in a single night. Even as a kid, I questioned the stupidity of this way of looking at life. Almost every moment of our life, we are facing any and all of the needs that are stated there. Just because you're hungry and you can't buy lunch, it doesn't mean that you also don't want to have a close and intimate relationship with friends. You can ask Job about that. He was at the very basic bottom of the level, and yet he still wanted friendship and his friends to recognize him as such. Maslow's pyramid was taught because teachers needed something to tell us during the long hours of each school day, and someone came up with a diagram that was more than they had done, and so people ran with it. There is no time when we can't fully actualize. And that actualization is never, no, not ever found in self. The concept of self-actualization is so ridiculous that it has ruined an entire generation of people who were taught that it was possible. To find out the most neurotic, self-consumed, lives out of control people on the planet, all you need to do is pick up a Hollywood magazine and read about the latest problems with that crowd. The people who have every one of Maslow's levels met and exceeded right up to the pointy top of it are also the ones who are drunks, adulterers, drug addicts, liars, hate-filled, shall I go on, Democrats, <laughs> and we want to emulate them. Actualization comes from one place and one place alone. You remember I read you this day in history and that man went to the gallows and he had actualized in Christ. And he was there in the Tower of London. He was there out in freedom and it didn't matter where he was, he had actualized in Christ. It comes from a personal relationship with the Lord. It comes from standing approved in him. When we cannot find approval from any other place, including self, the worst place of all to look to, we can and do find it in him. Our text verse today comes from Psalm 42. It's the first verse. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? King Ahasuerus is looking for a queen. Woohoo! Let's hope he finds a good one. Well, we know he did. We read the sermon text for the day. Her name is Esther. But by the end of our verses today, we find that he didn't delight in the queen completely. In fact, he failed in Maslow's pyramid there and in other areas. He is the king. He has all the money and power he could ever want. He could pursue whatever avenue of life he wanted to. Self-actualization? He should be the epitome of it. But he failed to find joy in his queen. And he failed to find security in his life. Actualization, apart from intimacy with the Lord, is impossible. He alone is the source of all things, and therefore he alone can meet our needs and our desires fully and completely. And he can and will do so to the point that we will never drop down a level on that crummy pyramid again. As long as we fix our eyes on Jesus, we have the full and complete actualization to carry us throughout the endless ages of eternity. This is a truth which can be found in his superior word. And so, let's turn to that precious word once again. And may God speak to us through his word today, and may his glorious name ever be praised. I have three separate thoughts for you today. The first is myrrh and perfumes. It's verses 12 through 14. Verse 12, each young woman's turn came to go into King Ahasuerus. Eventually, each of the virgin's selection would finally result in the purpose of their selection a night with the king, and a chance at being made queen. The word tor, or turn, is introduced. It will be seen here and in verse 15, and then twice in the Song of Solomon. It comes from the word tour, which signifies to spy something out. That in turn comes from a root, meaning to meander about. In the Song of Solomon, the word is used to describe rows of ornaments, such as jewels on a necklace. Together they are beautiful, and yet they are individual, radiant jewels. 
in this then we can see that it is as if the king here is winding his way through a process spying out that which will bring him to his final result the selection of a queen thus each virgin's turn is a guided process while the king's is a meandering one like slavery in the bible our modern sensibilities do not always coincide with what occurs in these stories. I heard lots of gasps from that corner of the uh, audience last week as I was reading some of the verses. Or maybe it was two weeks ago. I don't know. It was it was Linda, though. She was having, oh, oh, you know, you were talking. I remember what it was. It was talking about gathering of virgins from oh, really? Ethiopia to India, and you were going, I can't believe they were doing that. That's I remember that, yes. We may think of what is happening here as brutish or whatever other label we wish to pin on the event but this was the standard of the times and these were things which were common they were accepted and they were normative for this age it is certain that those of this period that we're looking at right now would look at our lives such as women wearing bikinis on the beach then they would find us to be way way out of proper moral bounds verse 12 continues after she had completed 12 months preparation according to the regulations for the women there were set laws for the virgin's preparation. This was not a willy-nilly process of just taking beautiful women from the provinces and then sending them arbitrarily to the king for his pleasure, but a refined process which was intended for the safety of the king, the honor of the office, and also for the king's delight. An entire year of beauty preparations was called for to ensure that nothing of her old life remained. First, such a period would ensure that she didn't come pregnant and thus defiled. That would quickly become noticeable. Further, if she was from a land of garlic, they would want that purged from her system so she only smelled delightful to the king. If she spent her days outdoors, her skin would be tanned and not whatever natural color she would be in the royal residence. And moral or physical flaw would have a chance to be revealed before she could either harm or disgrace the royal office. For these, or for any other reasons, the time of preparation lasted an entire year. The number 12 in the Bible signifies governmental perfection. And so we could infer that this is stated as well to indicate that any candidate for queen was properly evaluated to ensure she met the necessary qualifications for holding such a position within the government as well. Verse 12 continues, For thus were the days of their preparation apportioned six months with oil of myrrh. The word preparation, or maruk, here is closely associated with the word tamruk, which has already been seen and which is also used in this verse. It gives the sense of beautifying through rubbing with perfumery for purification. For six months, each virgin would be rubbed down with oil of myrrh. The first spice, mor, or myrrh, comes from marar. The word means bitter. The name gives the sense of distilling in drops. It has only been seen so far in Exodus chapter 30 in the making of the special incense for the burning of the incense in the tabernacle. Myrrh comes from a shrub, and it can be obtained in one of two ways. The first is the purest form where it naturally exudes from the plant. This is known as the myrrh of freedom or free-flowing myrrh. Inferior myrrh comes from the bark when incisions are made in it. Myrrh is fragrant to the smell, but bitter to the taste. Looking at the uses of myrrh in the Old Testament, the prominent idea which it symbolizes is love, but more especially love in an intimate union, but not necessarily sexual in nature. Myrrh was presented to Christ at both his birth by the Magi and at his death when mixed in wine to deaden his pain, something he refused. Verse 12 continues, then six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. The second six-month period is dedicated to rubbing her down with bosem or balsam. The word signifies fragrance and can be any of various balsam spices. Thus, the Hebrew word is in the plural. The modern words in English for both of these words have retained their Hebrew origin quite well. We have mor or myrrh and bosem, which is now balsam. After 12 months of such rubbing, the woman would be as sweet-smelling as she could possibly be, ready for the night of her calling. Verse 13, thus prepared, each young woman went to the king. The idea here was that there was only a presentation of the woman after a full treatment had been rendered. Once the time of purification and beautification had been met, she would await her turn for a chance to be elevated to the position 
of Queen, or to become a permanent concubine of him, living out her life among other concubines. In order to give her the best chances in her own mind of obtaining the former, she was given a very special honor. Verse 13 continues, and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the women's quarters to the king's palace. The idea here is that her presentation was whatever she thought would be most pleasing or enticing to the king. If she wanted a certain dress, a particular necklace, a given bit of makeup or eyeliner, and so on, that would be provided. This was her one big night, and it was her final chance to change her destiny, possibly going from provincial girl to royal queen. Whatever was kept in the women's quarters was allotted to her for her special night. Verse 14, in the evening she went, and in the morning she returned to the second house of the women. The translation here is correct concerning evening and morning. Some translations will incorrectly say, on the morrow. The account is written by a Hebrew. The Hebrew day began in the evening, not in the morning. Thus, it is the same day. To say, on the morrow, is a technical error as much as a very poor paraphrase. The virgin would go into the king in the evening, and when her night was completed, she would be directed to a new residence called the Second House of the Women. It is a house specifically maintained for the king's concubines. They would never be permitted to lay with any other man, nor could they ever seek marriage. It is said that Darius, who was conquered by Alexander, had 360 concubines. In 1 Kings, Solomon is said to have had a similar number. Here's what it says about him. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. These women who had gone into Ahasuerus were forever the king's property. They would remain that way for the rest of their lives. Their time would be filled with the enjoyments of the royal house and food, but there would be no contact for them with the outside world. There, they would have a new custodian to watch over them. Verse 14 going on, to the custody of Shaashgaz, the king's eunuch who kept the concubines. The king's eunuch, specially chosen for this particular duty, is Shaashgaz. This is the only time that he's mentioned in scripture. Albert Barnes identifies the name with either Sheshkunj, meaning beardless, or Setskunj, meaning weak of loins. Either Persian word would be a fitting description for a eunuch. In essence, then, he is named by his state. It would be like someone calling me Beardy, or maybe Mr. Muscle. Either way, the epithet would be a fitting one of the state in which I exist. Okay, the second one is a lie, I admit it. <laughs> Verse 14 continues, she would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and called for her by name. Under the care of Shaashgaz, the now defiled concubine would never leave the care of the king's eunuch again, unless the king was so enamored with her, and if his memory called her to mind, then it would happen. Otherwise, no. If so, she would be called for by name and would again be brought to him. It would not be hard for a woman who loathed her calling to simply make herself displeasing to the king on the first night. After this, she would forever be free from being forced to come into him again. But... It would also mean that she would be barren and unloved for the rest of her life as well. My night with the king, how will it be? Will he find delight and joy as I to him submit? Is there possibly royalty awaiting me? Will he to me the royal crown commit? How my heart trembles and my body shakes to step into his presence and to him submit. My head spins, my constitution quakes. Will he to me the royal crown commit? One night with the king, can it be true? Will there be many more as queen after I so submit? I am ready to present myself through and through. Will the king to me the royal crown commit? Our second thought today is the Feast of Esther. It's verses 15 through 18. Verse 15, now when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai. Here we learn the name of Esther's father, Abihail, or father of might. The term father is to be taken in the sense of possession, and so he is the possessor of might. Here he is also noted as the dod, or uncle of Mordecai. The word dod means uncle, but it also means beloved. Here we have Mordecai in a beloved relationship with the father of might. Any pictures there? 
That's that word right there. See, it says in that, uh, that picture, it says, Ani le dodi ve dodi li. It says, I am to my love and my love is to me. Up on that, that one right there, that, the painting on the wall. Oh, Linda's missing it. That's the word, dod. So it means uncle and it means beloved, okay? Anyway, verse 15 continues, who had taken her as his daughter to go into the king. It is Mordecai who had taken Esther to be his daughter. Now, this same Esther is about to have her chance to attain royal status, like all the other women before her were given. There can be only one, and so she will do as she is instructed, trusting in the word of another instead of her own futile attempt at attaining the king's approval. Verse 15 continues, she requested nothing but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women, advised. Instead of trusting in her own ability to discern what would be most pleasing to the king, she wisely takes the advice of the king's eunuch. As the king's eunuch, he would know exactly what was pleasing to him, and he would impart that knowledge to whoever he felt was worthy of receiving that inside information. It shows that he favored her, just as was seen in verse 9. Now, what do you think that's picturing? In this, we could infer a picture of being chosen for the king by grace through faith. The grace is imparted by Haggai. The faith is seen in her acknowledging his instruction. As the appointed trustee of the king, he would bear word from him to the women under his charge. He now exits the narrative and the Bible. Goodbye, Haggai. Verse 15 continues, And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. The word for favor is chen. It means grace, favor, and the like. A literal translation here would be, and Esther received grace in the eyes of all seeing her. She was obviously beautiful to behold, and when adorned with only those things recommended by the bearer of the king's words to the virgins, she received grace from all eyes which alighted upon her. Verse 16, so Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tibet, in the seventh year of his reign. As it is the seventh year of the reign of Ahasuerus, and as it is the tenth month, the time of this union is placed at either December or January of 479 B.C. or 478 B.C. The extended time between the events of chapter 1 and the events now is explained by the king's absence while waging war against Greece, a time in which he was defeated and suffered disgrace for his losses. Now, in order to redirect his mind away from that sad event, he is working on choosing a queen for the realm. This is the only mention of the month of Tibet in scripture. The name corresponds to the 10th month of the Egyptian calendar known as Tuvi. Verse 17, the king loved Esther more than all the other women. The list includes both his lesser wives and his concubines. In other words, there's a type of hierarchy among the king's women. There is the chosen queen. After her would be his chosen wives. They would pay respect to the queen, but they were also given privileges as wives, such as special quarters, a set revenue from the taxes, and things like that. Then below them would be the concubines. Esther was more loved than all of these. Therefore, verse 17 continues, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. Vatisachen vachesed lepanav and obtained grace and loving kindness before him. The addition of the words, more than all the virgins, repeats what we have already deduced. None of the secondary wives who were below Vashti were desired by him in making one of them queen. Instead, virgins were sought out, among whom Esther prevailed, being the fairest virgin of them all. These words now close out one of our sets of twos. In verse 9, Esther found chesed lepanav, or loving kindness before Hegai. Here she finds chen vachesed lepanav, or grace and loving kindness before the king. There it was the favor of the keeper of the women. Here it concerns the love of the king. They contrast, and yet they confirm that she was pleasing in all ways as a refined and beautiful woman. In Haggai is seen a parallel to the work of the Spirit who searches out and prepares those circumcised in heart to be pleasing to God. Through him grace is found, and after that grace and loving kindness, it is displayed towards God's people. Verse 17 continues, So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. The setting of the crown is the conferral of the position. In this act she was raised from concubine to queen from unwed to wife. 
It was now her position to fill the place of the vanquished Vashti, who is mentioned for the last time here in Scripture. We can wave goodbye to Vashti now. Verse 18, Then the king made a great feast, the feast of Esther, for all his officials and servants. This is, like the other feasts mentioned, a banqueting feast. This one is, however, termed Mishte Gadol, or a great banquet. Whether this was the customary type of feast for a newly appointed queen, or whether it is because of the exceptional beauty and grace found in Esther, either way it would have been a magnificent ordeal. It was one to which all of those in high positions would have been invited, and all would be careful to heap high praises upon her as choice for queen. Verse 18 continues, And he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of a king. Here a word is found only this once in the entire Bible, Hanacha, translated here as holiday. The word comes from the word nuach, meaning rest. And so holiday is not a bad guess. However, some translations will say a release. Others say a remission of taxes. This would then give the sense of rest from taxes. It could even be that the queen's gold is what is being referred to. As I said earlier, a certain portion was collected from various cities, which was given as a revenue to the wives of the king. Adam Clark thinks that this is what Esther may have done by petitioning the king to give a rest from this particular tax. Thus, it would make her a very popular queen. The people would be freed from this obligation for a certain amount of time or even during the entire time of her filling the position. Whatever the case, it's best to not get dogmatic and stick with any one translation, which could be entirely wrong. Along with this release, gifts were extended to those who found favor in the king's eyes during this happy celebration. I have found favor before the king, and in his eyes I am highly esteemed. The honor bestowed upon me makes my heart sing. What chance was there? None, so it seemed. But in the eyes of the king I found grace and favor. And so before him now, as his bride, I stand, rejoicing in this moment, one I will forever savor, when the king extended to me his loving hand. And upon my head the royal crown has been set. As the queen, I shall be nearer to him, just at his side. But from where I came, I shall never forget. Never shall my heart be filled with pride. Instead, I will be grateful for the position given to me, a queen to the king. Oh, how can it be? Our third thought today is a plot against the king. It's verses 19 through 23. Verse 19, when virgins were gathered together a second time. This is now the second noted gathering of virgins. The first was in verse 2, 8. The first gathering was to find a queen. The second gathering is after a queen has been selected. The first gathering was for the king to find sufficiency in a queen. The second is to fill a void in the king's desired harem. One meant a good life for Esther. The second could mean death for her. They contrast, and yet they confirm that the king was always on the lookout for others to find pleasure in. The translation of the New King James Version here is correct. Many versions say, and when the virgins were gathered the second time. There is no definite article in front of either virgins or second. Adding in a definite article in either place leads to a false idea of what is being said. These are not the same group of virgins, and there is no subsequent gathering of them. Instead, this is a new group of virgins, and it is a stand-alone occurrence. One must ask, why is this mentioned at all? What difference does it make in placing this statement here instead of just not mentioning it at all? These questions have actually plagued scholars for eons. Some see this as going back to what happened before Esther's marriage and reliving an event which took place then. That is disproved in the second clause of this verse. Some insert a plot by the royal officials to supplant Esther. Nothing indicates that. It is forced and it is incorrect. No commentary that I read really gives suitable reason for the inclusion of these words. But to understand them merely takes looking ahead to what Esther says in chapter 4. Here's from chapter 4. Then Esther spoke to Hatak and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law. Put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. 
chapter 3 shows that this was after the start of the 12th year of the king's reign, or five full years later. It was apparent that despite Esther finding favor in the king's eyes, even enough to be made queen, he still was enjoying the privilege of being king by bringing in another batch of virgins. After five years of being queen, he was still more interested in what was new and exciting than he was in her. Because he was enjoying this avenue, she had not been called to be with the king. If she were out of his favor because he found a virgin he favored more, entering his presence without permission would mean her death. Though she was a queen, it did not permit her to approach his throne without first being called. This is the reason for including this seemingly irrelevant note about a second gathering of virgins. Verse 19 continues, Mordecai sat within the king's gate. These words right here show that the previous clause was not referring back to before a time when she was made queen. At that time, he is said to have paced in front of the women's quarters. Now he sits within the king's gate. He was then and is now where she can be most easily contacted. Due to her occupying the queen's residence, the nearest place that he could be to obtain news about her was right at this spot here. Each word and clause is carefully selected to show a logical progression of the story, while at the same time showing that God is in the background, directing the events despite the choices and decisions of man. Verse 20, now Esther had not revealed her family and her people, just as Mordecai had charged her. Verse 20 is parenthetical between verses 19 and 21. It is providing information necessary to develop the theme which is continuing on in this story. The primary placement of the word family in the Hebrew here is notable. As John Lang says of it, this is here placed first because the relation of Esther to Mordecai is under consideration. The fact that she was Jewish has nothing to do with her hiding the matter, as if she was ashamed of it, or as if it could have or could still harm her in the eyes of the king. That is entirely unfounded, and by the end of the story, that is going to be seen wrong. It is Mordecai who has instructed her, and that is all that matters. He is concerned about her and others' perceptions of her in relation to him. Their nationality is of secondary concern. This is now the ending of another set of twos. She was shown to have concealed her identity in verse 210, and the same is said of her now in this verse. The first was at the command of Mordecai, and the second is in obedience to his command. They contrast, and yet they confirm the obedience of Esther to her adopted father, and in this, no faithlessness to the king or anyone else can be noted, but a great faithfulness to Mordecai is seen. This is substantiated by the next words. Verse 20 continues, For Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. The inclusion of these words shows the faithfulness of Esther to Mordecai. Her royal position and whatever wealth and honor she possessed was seen as secondary to her faithful allegiance to the one who raised her and nurtured her. This may also show a humility in Mordecai. With her advancement to queen, he also could have risen in the royal court. But by keeping their family unit a secret, Mordecai would retain his particular position without any additional pomp and favor being bestowed to him. The intimate family connection between the two is what is highlighted. In this, the word omna, or being brought up, is given. This is the only time that it's found in the Bible, and it gives the sense of training or tutelage. His raising of her resulted in a faithful, obedient stepdaughter. Now, I want you to remember every single thing that we're reading here is pointing to something. It's pointing to something. And we'll get to it in the last sermon, which, by the way, I have to type tomorrow. And I have no idea all of the details. I've been stressing over this now for weeks and weeks thinking this through. And there are some really marvelous things that have come out. But it's not done yet. So if you say a prayer tonight about sermon typing, I'd appreciate it. Verse 21. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Bigthan and Teresh, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. The story now proceeds from verse 19 after the parenthetical insert. It is possible that Big Don is the same person as Big Da in verse 110. This is not improbable because the name changes a third time in verse 6-2 to Big Dana. If this is the same person, he was high in the king's court. 
Teresh may have been elevated to that same rank at some point during the intervening years. Together, they were considered doorkeepers. The Hebrew word for door here is one which is translated also as a bowl, a basin, or a cup. Thus, this is a door where there is a curved-in threshold, and probably then the very entranceway to the king's bedroom. This would have been a position of the highest trust, because it would also be the position easiest to rush upon and kill the king. Somehow, Mordecai learned that they had evil intent for the king, any speculation about why they were angry or how Mordecai found out is irrelevant, and it goes unstated. What is rather unusual is that eventually, history records that this same king, Xerxes, would eventually be murdered by a Tarbanus, the captain of the guard, and As Pamitras, a chamberlain and eunuch. One plot against him was foiled in the Bible, but another would eventually see his end in extra-biblical literature. This verse introduces here a set of twos. Here are the words of the deeds of Big Don and Teresh. The doorkeepers of Ahasuerus are reported by Mordecai. The exact same words, Mordecai, Big Don, Teresh, doorkeepers, and Ahasuerus are all repeated in verse 6-2. The two accounts differ as one is occurring and one has occurred, but they confirm that what has occurred is crucial to the unfolding events of the lives of all concerned. Verse 22. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. As speculated in the previous sermon, Mordecai was possibly a eunuch or a doorkeeper of some level within the royal compound. This makes it not at all improbable that he could have heard of the plot against the king. However the word came to him, he passed it on to Esther, and from there it was passed on to the king in Mordecai's name. This would have had two positive results. First, it would vouch for the truthfulness of the information, and secondly, it would hopefully benefit Mordecai in a time of future need. It is a note of wisdom on the part of Esther to thus pass on the information in this manner. It would also directly lead to the salvation of the Jews as well as the exaltation of Mordecai. Verse 23, and when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed and both were hanged on a gallows. The inquiry was certainly one which involved torture. Anyone who threatened the king would face death, and so a denial would be expected. Eventually, a confession would be gathered concerning the matter, and then execution would be handed down. In this case, the word tala, or hanging, is what is used. However, it doesn't necessarily mean hanging by a rope. In Deuteronomy 21, it says these words, if a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree... His body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, for he who is hanged is accursed of God. Paul then cites that same verse from Deuteronomy in Galatians 3 verse 13 to indicate crucifixion. This was known to be a common practice in Persia at the time, and so they may have been hung to a tree by crucifixion. The word translated as gallows here simply means wood from a tree. However, they departed. It would have been an ouchy way to go. Verse 23 finishes us today with these words, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. We finish with words that would otherwise be unimportant except for the continuance of the narrative. It is these words here which will bring about another chain of events which will lead to Jewish salvation when it seemed that they were to be destroyed. Like other courts of the ancient Middle East, the Persians had scribes who sat before the king and recorded what they did. They would move with him and keep a constant record of events. For the king, it would be like a careful diary that he could refer to any time in order to bring back to memory things that he may have let slip during the busy hours of his daily life. At times during the narrative of these verses, it seems hard to grasp why certain things are mentioned. As I said, a couple verses in particular have left scholars scratching their heads and reaching out for explanations which have failed to sufficiently answer the situation or circumstance. But because this is the Word of God, each word is carefully selected and even carefully placed within the Hebrew in order to show us a marvelously unfolding tapestry of God's wisdom concerning how to resolve a matter which seems completely out of control as well as his never-ending watch over and care for 
his people. Nothing is superfluous. Nothing is left out. And each detail shows meticulous attention. As we continue on, it will appear that the Jews will be destroyed. This would include those back in the land after return from exile. There would be nothing left of them because of the hatred of one man soon to be introduced. However, God promised in the law of Moses that they would always be kept as a people. Esther will show how this promise continued to be kept. But it is the little details now that are getting us to that point. Again, we can look to these things and we can insert our own selves right into them as God's faithfulness is concerned. Once he speaks, that word is stronger than iron. When it is recorded, it is to be considered an everlasting surety that we can cling to. Christ Jesus has established his church, and his church is made up of individuals. As carefully as he watched over Mordecai and Esther, guess what? He is watching over us. Both Mordecai and Esther are going to face stress and trouble, but both of them, along with their people, will also be delivered. No matter what we face, the Lord has said that because of our faith in Christ Jesus, we are sealed with a guarantee, the greatest guarantee of all the Holy Spirit. Our salvation is set. It is set. To question that after God has sealed us is to question God's integrity. Let us not waver in our conviction and let us stand fast on the truth of his word. In the end, we will stand approved, not because of our reliability, certainly not because of Charlie Garrett's reliability. Leave it up to me and I'd lose myself 10 minutes after we leave church today. I guarantee it. But it's because of his He is ever faithful when we are completely faithless. This is the glory of what God has done for us. He has given us his word. His word is an extension of who he is. His word is truth. And because his word is truth and because he is truth, whatever his word says cannot be violated. He has promised in his word that he will keep Israel forever. If he broke that word, it would mean nothing to us about our salvation. But the very fact that there is a group of people back in the land of Israel, exactly when he prophesied that they would be back there and they are dwelling there and they will never be uprooted again is the surest sign of all for us. We can cling to that. We can absolutely cling to it and say he did it for them. He kept his word despite their faithlessness. When you blow it, he's already taken care of it for you. He's figured in your errors all the way through to your final demise or the rapture when he takes you home to glory. Absolutely assured, okay? And along the way, we have trials, don't we? I mean, we have all kinds of things that pop up in our life. We have difficulties. How am I going to figure out tomorrow's problem at work? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? He's got it all figured out. We don't see it. And so we get the stress and the anxiety, don't we? Well, what does it say in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? Be anxious for nothing. For nothing. Hand it over to the Lord, pray to him, thank him for his wonderful deliverance, and above all, give your life to Jesus Christ if you have not. You have no assurance at all. As a matter of fact, you do have assurance if you haven't come to Christ. You have the absolute assurance of being separated from God forever. And who wants that? You get all the delight of eternity in the presence of God, with the saints of God, without all of the crummy things we have in this life if you simply call on Jesus Christ. Today is the day of salvation, and now is the time of God's favor. Call out to Jesus. Our closing verse comes from 1 Corinthians 1. It's verses 4 through 9. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. All right. Don't worry about things. You are in fellowship with Christ. And if you step out of fellowship, he hasn't let go of you. All right. Next week is Esther 3. It's verses 1 through 15. Whether Jew under a star or the church under a steeple, it's entitled, There is a Certain People. That'll be your fifth Esther sermon. The Lord has you exactly where he wants you. He has a good plan and a purpose for you. At times you might feel as if he has no great design for you in life, but he has brought you to this moment to reveal his glory in and through you. So follow him and trust him and he will do marvelous things for you and through you, okay? 
Our poem today is called A Night with the King. Each young woman's turn came to go into King Ahasuerus. It was when, after she had completed 12 months preparation, according to the regulations for the women. For thus were the days of their preparation appointed, six months with oil of myrrh for a really good smell, and six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women as well. Thus prepared, each young woman went to the king, and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the women's quarters to the king's palace as she was so inspired. In the evening she went, and in the morning she returned to the second house of the women, her new confines, to the custody of Shaashgaz, the king's eunuch, who kept the concubines. She would not go in to the king again for sure unless the king delighted in her and by name called for her. Now when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter to go into the king by and by, she requested nothing but what Hegai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women advised, and Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her with her beauty Everyone was hypnotized. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the 10th month, we know, which is the month of Tibet in the seventh year of his reign. It was so. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight. More than all the virgins, Esther pleased the king on that night. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen, replacing Vashti instead. Then the king made a great feast, the Feast of Esther. For all his officials and servants, he did this thing. Then he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of a king. When virgins were gathered together a second time on that date, Mordecai sat within the king's gate. Now Esther had not revealed her family and her people, just as Mordecai had charged her, so she did. For Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai, as when she was brought up by him, even as a kid. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, they were treasonous, Bigthan and Teresh doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther just the same, and Esther informed the king, yes, she informed the king in Mordecai's name. And when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on a gallows, so they were dangling. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. You got to think of something to rhyme. <laughs> Lord God, thank you for your presence that is with us, even when we don't realize that you are there. Because you sent your own son, Jesus, we can know that you truly do care. And so, Lord, be real to us in a wonderful new way. Open our minds and our hearts to seeing you always. Through every step we take and throughout every day, be real to us, O oh God. And to you we shall give all of our praise. Hallelujah and amen. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the wonderful assurance we have. We thank you for how you've woven this tapestry of Esther's life together and Mordecai's life and that of all of the Jews. And it shows us that you're doing the same for us individually. You've got everything under control. Everything is taken care of. And we certainly thank you for that. But Lord, at the beginning of this uh, service today, we had many prayer requests that we laid before you. And we can't go through all of the names. I can't remember half of them. them. There's so many. But you know each and every one of them, people that are having sickness and trials and all kinds of pains. Lord, we lift them up to you right now. We ask that you bless them, that you take care of them, that you meet their needs according to your wisdom. And if it's your will to bring them back to health, to bring them back to financial stability, to bring them back to uh, a proper place in their job life, whatever it is, we pray for it that you would show yourself our creator and our redeemer and the one who loves us so much that you do tend to our needs. Even if you don't meet them in the way that we expect, we know that you will meet them because you are great and you are glorious. And so we pray these things in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. Okay, here we go. Vic, I forgot to give you this. you got to remind me of that there. Sorry about that. We get the uh, instruction for the Lord's Supper directly from the pages of the Bible. And there we get the words from the hand of Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. He wrote, um, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And he would have given thanks over this. He would have said, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam HaMotzi Lechem Min HaAretz. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. 
and he broke it, and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, and he would have blessed us as well. He would have said, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu, Elecha Olam, Borei Peri HaGafen. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning. Is oh, That's not at all what I wanted to say, is it? <laughs> the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> there we go. I'm trying to finish up and get you guys out the door too quickly today. Come forward. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Still asleep here. Oh, I'm too. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The yes, the rain will do it every time. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Good to have you here, Thor. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ninety or ninety-one? Ninety. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Just so you all know, Darlene's mother, Arlena, who you met, she's too weak to come to church anymore, but she turned 90. And so we want to, in our hearts, wish her a happy birthday and have her in our prayers for a wonderful and happy year ahead as she... Uh, as they head up to New uh, North Carolina, maybe this week, depending on the rain. Mm-hmm. We don't want them driving, you know, when it's mm-hmm. raining. But uh, it's been wonderful having you here this uh, winter. And we wish your mom a very happy birthday. And, uh, and just be blessed as you drive. And let me know you got there safely, okay? Mm-hmm. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful life you've given us. Despite all of the trials and all of the things that come against our joy, you are our source of joy. And you are the place where we can fully actualize. We can come to the greatest heights of joy, even in dirty prisons, even at 
the end of a gallows rope if that is what is ordained for our lives, we, because we know that the next step is into eternity in your presence. What a great and wonderful hope that we have because of these things. Lord God, we love you, we praise you, we exalt you, and we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.